Good morning, and welcome to Morning Prayer at Christ Episcopal Church. My name is Keith Oglesby. I'm one of the clergy here. Glad to be with you again this morning as we approach our second year anniversary of saying morning prayer together. We use a form according to the Book of Common Prayer, and again, if you're not used to it, if this is your first time or you're just starting up with us, please give me a call or anyone at the church. We'd be glad to answer your questions. Uh, we can pray in all times in all different ways, but this is a, a tradition that goes back centuries that helps us kind of shape our prayers. Uh, so it's kind of like reading um, some good work of art to help inspire us to do our own work, and but to do it together in a way that we are drawn closer to God. So uh, we begin on page 78 of the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, we'll begin with our uh, confession of sin after an opening sentence of Scripture. <clears throat> if, again, if you don't have a Book of Common Prayer, please contact the church and we'll get one. Uh, actually, we'll be on page 76 with our opening sentence of Scripture for the season of Epiphany. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That's from the prophet Isaiah, speaking both of Israel and Christians believe of Jesus. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, continuing on page 80 of your Book of Common Prayer, Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. And then our antiphon, which is again uh, a prayer both before and after our song of praise, which for us this day, I'm going to change it up. There are two standard ones offered for the night and the jubilate. We'll do the jubilate today and for a season now. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. And now we move to the psalm appointed for today in morning prayer, which is Psalm 88, which can be found on page 712 of the Book of Common Prayer. So again, Psalm 88, and it's page 712. And if you don't know, the Book of Common Prayer has its own translation of the Psalter that goes back into the early centuries of the Church of England being separate and coming up with the Book of Common Prayer, and it's been revised, but still based on that uh, translation that goes back to the 16th century. So it's distinct from psalms that you may know, like uh, the King James Version, or more currently, like the New Revised Standard Version. So just know when it's different. It's still based on the same Hebrew primarily, uh, with also the Greek and Latin being compared, but to have that fresh translation for our Book of Common Prayer. Psalm 88, page 712. O Lord, my God, my Savior, by day and night I cry to you. Let my prayer enter into your presence. Incline your ear to my lamentation, for I am full of trouble. My life is at the brink of the grave. 
I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I have become like one who has no strength, lost among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the depths of the pit, in dark places and in the abyss. Your anger weighs upon me heavily, and all your great waves overwhelm me. You have put my friends far from me. You have made me to be abhorred by them. I am in prison and cannot get free. My sight has failed me because of trouble. Lord, I have called upon you daily. I have stretched out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Will those who have died stand up and give you thanks? Will your loving kindness be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in the land of destruction? Will your wonders be known in the dark, or your righteousness in the country where all is forgotten? But as for me, O Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why have you rejected me? Why have you hidden your face from me? Ever since my youth I have been wretched and at the point of death. I have borne your terrors with a troubled mind. Your blazing anger has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. They surround me all day long like a flood. They encompass me on every side. My friend and my neighbor you have put away from me, and darkness is my only companion. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And as I've said before about the Psalms, they have the full range of human experience and emotions. They are not a only a positive thinking uh, source, but also uh, an acknowledgement of those times in our life when we feel abandoned uh, by friend or by God, and that we can, in those times, still cry out to God. And that is a part of our faith that is acceptable. And why that is, is that we have to be honest. We can't put on a happy face that's false with God or with others. And again, of course, we don't want to go around always uh, mopey, uh, but there are times in our life where sadness, grief, even anger are the appropriate emotions. We have to live through those times and then ultimately to trust in God. And that's also what the Psalter, the Psalms do for us. Now, our reading is an important reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Um, and if you haven't read it lately, I would suggest reading the whole thing, perhaps in one sitting, uh, or at least starting from chapter 12. We're going to read from chapter 13 of Romans, verses 1 through 14. But chapter 12 is at the end of an argument, uh, you know, philosophical argument by Paul in chapters 9, 10, and 11 about the role of Judaism or the legacy of Israel, which he fully identified with, but now as a follower of Jesus, what does all that mean? And you have to kind of follow the whole argument. At the end, though, of chapter 11, he talks about that we're all Jew and Gentile under God's mercy. And that's what matters. And so then in chapters 12 and 13, from that, he makes certain assertions of how to live our faith. And so read those, if you will. But chapter 13, we'll read today, verses 1 through 14. I'll make some comments after. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid. For the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is a servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes for the authorities or God's servants. Busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due them. Taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. 
Owe no man, owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, but in nor in debauchery and licentiousness, nor in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Here ends the lesson. So a lot in here, and again, all in the context of God's mercy, God's call to us. The first part has been a, a subject of debate about being subject to the governing authorities, especially in the 20th century, where you had these dramatic examples of resistance, a very strong Christian people, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Jim Crow segregated South, that they came in different paths to resist what was evil. So we have to embrace that part of our tradition and read the scripture with that realization that there are times where governments are not doing God's will. Now, the complex thing, for me at least, is that Paul was a person who was arrested multiple times and beaten and eventually executed by the sword that he alludes to. Uh, and so he still had this tension of doing what's right, you know, to follow the laws, so to speak, uh, that's good for all of us, but not surrendering his conscience. And perhaps that is the path that we should follow, is if we believe uh, that God has called us to live uh, faithfully to Jesus Christ and to love others, to include others. Any laws that resist that, we need to resist. So it's kind of counter, but I think counter in a good way of more fully understanding how Paul lived, as well as the words on this page. Um, so probably not violently, but through our conscience, our faith, and our love to resist what is evil. And what he said in chapter 12, actually, is don't be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. That is our calling. So uh, read it at your leisure with prayer and knowing God is calling us to live a certain way because of God's mercy and because of Jesus, the embodiment of that mercy. So as our reflection, uh, a canticle from, again, page 93, canticle 18, from the book of Revelation, a song, again, of worship, Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation, a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits upon the throne, and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor, forever and forevermore. And now let us recite our historical faith as recorded in the Apostles' Creed, page 96. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Continuing on page 97, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. That was our colic from this past Sunday, the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. Now our uh, colic for morning prayer for Friday. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our prayer for mission is found on page 101. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, to the honor of your name. Amen. So you can pause the video stream now. Take your time to pray as long as you want, your intercessions, your thanksgivings. And then I'll pause for a few seconds before we uh, offer some I offer some thanksgivings, and we move to the general thanksgiving. Lord, we do thank you for our nation and for all the good and the blessings of it. We pray for our people that we may learn to love and respect one another. And we pray for our congregation in this Northeast Florida community that we serve, that you would give us wisdom and again, that compassion that transcends uh, beliefs and boundaries, colors, ethnicities, help us to love as you love. And now let us say together the general thanksgiving again on page 101. Almighty God, source of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service, by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Again, the morning prayer today is going to be a little bit longer. I guess I got to preach in some. Hopefully those reflections were helpful. I hope you have a wonderful Friday, and I look forward to seeing you sometime soon. Again, may God bless you.